So Lord Sri Krishna, he appeared on this planet approximately 5,118, no, actually 5,118 years plus 125. So Kali Yuga, the age of Kali began 5,118 years ago, exactly. And Krishna appeared on this planet and stayed for 125 years. Why does the Lord come to this material world? What purpose does he have here? Everything is there in the spiritual world. But he makes himself, what we say, available for his devotees. So to push them closer to the goal of life. Therefore, out of compassion he comes. He comes out of compassion, that's all. He's merciful. If you know a person who is wealthy, if you know a person who is famous, and if you know a person who has many, what we say, uh, a lot of opulences in their life, but they're not kind, and they're not very caring for others, who cares? <laughs> Krishna has all these qualities, but at the same time, he's very kind. He's very kind. And that's, what, that's why the devotees are attracted to Krishna. His beauty, his, of course, his strength, his opulences, his fame, his knowledge, and his renunciation. But all that is decorated with his mercy. And his mercy is actually himself. So in order to show mercy to us, the conditioned souls in this material world, he comes. Yada yada hi dharmas yad glanir bhavati bharatam abhutanam adatmanam sadatmeham srijamiyaham pravitranayam sadunam vinasanaya chaduskritam dharma samstarpanatayam sambhavami yuge yuge. And Krishna states in the Bhagavad Gita, the seventh, seventh and eighth verse of the fourth chapter, his reasons for coming. But actually, he gives three reasons to, to somehow or other, when the earth or the, the universal planetary systems become too much disturbed by sinful activities, he comes just to bring back dharma and at the same time remove dharma, ir, irreligion, adharma, from the world. But he could do that without coming, although he says he comes for that reason. But he actually comes to give pleasure to his devotees. That's the real, only he can do that. No incarnation or anyone else can provide that, what we say, element of Krishna except his personal presence. And when he comes, he leaves behind true religious principles and a way to keep connected with him through the process of devotional service. So there's a beautiful set of prayers, which I'll read, which I think are really very fundamental to this appearance of the Lord. Because many, many philosophers, scholars, academic initiates, and spiritualists speculate, why does the Lord come? And here, one of the greatest of all devotees who is mentioned in the Srimad Bhagavatam is Queen Kunti. She's Krishna's aunt. She has a personal loving relationship with Krishna in a superior position as a mother, an auntie. In other words, in paternal affection. Now she's praying to the Lord. And she says, O soul of the universe, that you work though you're inactive and you take birth although you are the vital force in the unborn, You yourself descend amongst animals, men, sages, aquatic. Verily, this is very bewildering. So although she's so close to Krishna, she can't understand. My dear Krishna, Mother Yasoda took up a rope to bind you when you committed an offense, and your perturbed eyes overflooded with tears which washed away the mascara from your eyes. And you were afraid, though fear personified is afraid of you. This sight is bewildering to me. She's, she's the supreme personality of God that appears in his different manifestations to accept loving relationships from his pure devotees who also descend with him to give him pleasure in his activities. And he acts like a little child. He steals butter. He causes mischief. I mean, 
when kids do that, they're considered to be naughty. But when Krishna does that, everybody becomes happy. They actually enjoy when Krishna steals butter. But can Krishna steal anything? Can God steal anything? Everything belongs to him anyway. We're the ones that are thieves. <laughs> we take more than we need, <laughs> and that's why we suffer. But Krishna, everything belongs to him. So he could steal the whole universe, and it's actually he's just bringing everything back to where it belongs. That's Krishna. <laughs> so this is sight is bewildering. And then she goes on. Some say that the unborn, referring to him, is born for the glorification of the pious kings. And others say he is born to please King Yadav, one of your dearest devotees. You appear in his family as sandalwood appears in the Malayan hills. So now she goes on to say, you are, bo you are considered to take birth. We talk about janmastami, right? Janma. Janma means what? Birth. But it's, can God take birth? He appears, but we call it a birth. He has a mother and a father, although he is not, he, he is the source of all mothers and fathers. Just like you see the sun on the horizon, and the sun will set, and then after some time again it will rise. So the rising and the setting of the sun, we describe the sun in that way. But does the sun rise and the sun set? No, the sun doesn't go anywhere. It simply continues in its orbit. And what are we seeing? We're seeing the rising and the setting because that's our perspective. So unless one understands the nature of God, one will think, oh, yeah, he took birth just like us. He had a mother, he had a father, he did so many things. You know, we may be a little bit better than us. <laughs> but actually, his activities are called divyam. Janma, karma, chame, divyam. Divyam means transcendental. And Krishna gives an interesting statement. He says, one who knows, one who knows the nature, uses the word nature, of my appearance in this world and my activities which come with that appearance, because you have reached perfection, you do, not, you, do not go back, you do not come back to this material world. You, you attain to your spiritual perfectional destination. Simply by knowing that. This is why this John Mastami celebration, John Mastami festival, is so, so important. Because to hear about Krishna, to glorify Krishna, to worship Krishna, to appreciate others who are doing the same, you get so much spiritual blessings. And those blessings turn in to awareness of the nature of God. And the more we know about God, the more we're attracted to God, and the more we're attracted to God, the more we can become free from the sufferings of this material world. So Krishna's mercy manifests in that way, just to bring us free from suffering and to bring us closer to his lotus feet. Queen Kunti goes on. She's not satisfied in glorifying the Lord simply in one way. She says, others say that since both Vasudev and Devaki prayed for you, you have taken your birth as their son. Undoubtedly, you are unborn, yet you take birth for their welfare and to kill those who are envious of the demigods. Now she's glorifying how Krishna loves his devotees so much. Devotees perform so many austerities. Why? Just to get Krishna as his son. Vasudeva and Devaki were Krishna's mother and father for three births, three appearances of the Lord. The first time they were Sutapa and, uh, what was his name? Prishni and Sutapa, and they had a son called Prishni Garba, who was a Vishnu manifestation of the Lord. In the second manifestation, they were Kashyapa and Aditi, and they had Vamanadev, the little dwarf Brahman, Upendra, as their son. And now, because of their austerities, the Lord again wanted to satisfy them, so he appears as their mother and father, Devaki and Vasudev. 
So that's Krishna's mercy. He always, he's always thinking how to serve his devotees. And his devotees are always thinking how to serve him. This is the relationship between God and his devotees. Devotees think, how can I serve the Lord? How can I do something to please the Lord? What pleases the Lord? Or what pleases those devotees who are dear to the Lord? Which is good as pleasing the Lord. So this is Krishna. He wants to satisfy his devotees. And then Queen Kunti goes on. Others say that the world, being overburdened like a boat at sea, is much aggrieved. And he didn't like the leaders of the earth who are all Kshatriya kings. They were ruling without qualifications. They were proud. They were envious. And they were vicious. So Parasaram with his axe, killed 21 generations of Kshatriya kings. And now there was no rule on the earth. What to do? And so the saintly persons got together along with the remaining ruling authorities and said, what are we going to do? There's no kings to rule the different areas of the world. Let's make a plan. So they made a very interesting plan. This is from Mahabharata. And what was that plan? They decided to unite all the princesses who were born from Kshatriya kings with the saints to bring union between Kshatriyas and Brahmins and create a new class of Kshatriya rulers who will be called Rajarsis, or what they call Rajarishis, or kings that are endowed with spiritual acumen, spiritual power, spiritual knowledge. And so that happened successfully. It was a very difficult experiment. The sages had to make a sacrifice, and they did, in order to bring about saintly rule. And the world, again, was flourishing under such rule. But then what happened? The demons decided to attack the demigods in the higher planets. And there was a big battle. And this, this happens. Some people think, oh, we just go to heavenly planets. It's so nice up there. You live long and you have, the women are very beautiful. The men are very qualified. And you have long life and you don't get sick so much. And everything is, when we say materially, very nice. That's heaven. But the problem is the demons attack every once in a while. So there goes your peace. peace. <laughs> No peace. So the demons attacked the heavenly planets. And they decided to make Earth their base to fight the demons, the demigods. So, in taking, so they decided to take birth in all species of life on the Earth. That's why you see when Kamsa was there, there were so many demons in various types of... We had Agasura. He was a... What was he? A snake. We had... Aristosaur in the form of a bull. We had Bacchusaur in the form of a duck. What else did we have? All kinds of, huh? Vatsasaur, he was also a duck, huh? A calf, yeah, Vatsasaur. So these demons took birth in every type of species, including the humans. And then again, the whole earth became what we say a dharma. And that's where Krishna comes. Because it says in the Krishna book, or it says in Srimad Bhagavatam, that when the world was overburdened, the Lord appeared. And that was the prelude, 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 what's the word? Prelude, okay, we got it. Prelude to Krishna's appearance. And so we see today, can we say the world is a little bit overburdened with sinful activities? I think it's a, it's a fair, uh, what we say, evaluation. And so, Queen Kunti goes on. And she says, And yet others say you have appeared to rejuvenate devotional service of hearing, remembering, worshipping, and so on, in order that the conditioned souls suffering from material pangs may take advantage and gain liberation. So as she's going on, she's mentioning the different reasons. She culminates with this. 
that the Lord actually comes to bring about devotional service to himself. And he has come again. He came 5,000 years ago as his appearance of Krishna in the house of Nanda Maharaj. Nandakeya Nanda Varya. Nandakeya Nanda Varya. Come on, you can do better than that. Anandakeya Nanda Varya. Hati Palaka Palaki. Hati Palak. Hati Gauda Palaki. <laughs> Ananda K Ananda Varya Ananda K Ananda Varya Hati Gauda Palaki Jai Kanaya Lalaki Jai Kanaya Lalaki Okay, sorry for the interruption there. <laughs> So there's joy in the house of Nanda Maharaj. And there's joy in the hearts of the devotees when the Lord appears. That, that joy is that everything becomes auspicious. And now the Lord, although he appeared 5,000 and some years ago in the house of Nanda Maharaj to give pleasure to the cowherd community in Braj, he has appeared again as the holy name of the Lord. Kali Kale, Nama Rupa, Krishna Avatar. So in this age, Krishna has again descended. He's not satisfied simply coming in his personal form as Sri Krishna, which we celebrate as John Mastami. But every day is John Mastami. Why? Because Krishna has appeared in the holy name. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare. There's no difference between Krishna in his deity form. Krishna, who appeared 5,000 years ago in his personal form, and Krishna as Namrup. No difference. Anyone who sees the difference of these three is seeing materially. Actually, Krishna has appeared in the found of his holy name. So we can, we can access the presence of Krishna in our hearts simply by this process. Why? Because Chaitanya Mahaprabhu has empowered this process with all his mercy. He has come simply to bring Krishna again. Although he appeared in 5,000 years ago as Krishna in Sri Vrindavan Dham. And we want to hear about Krishna's pastimes. Krishna's pastimes in Sri Vrindavan Dham awaken attraction for Krishna. But that same attraction that can be awakened by simply by chanting the holy names of the Lord. Nama Chintamani Krishnas Chaitanya Rasra Vigraha Purnyo Sudo Nitya Mukta Abhinna Tvam Nami Nami No. Krishna's name is Krishna. No difference. Krishna's name has all the qualities of Krishna. No difference. Krishna's name includes all the forms of the Lord. No difference. And Krishna's name is the embodiment of all his spiritual activities, his pastimes in Sri Vrindavan Dham. So we want to hear more about Krishna. Because by hearing about Krishna, we lose. Now, this is dangerous. You ready? If you get attracted to Krishna, you're going to lose your attraction for this world. Are you ready? You are. Okay. You sure? Because Rupa Goswami warns us. He says, don't go. Don't go. Don't go down to the banks of the river Jamuna in the place called Keshigat, where this beautiful boy standing in a threefold bending form, playing on his flute, wearing a yellow dhoti with a beautiful peacock, blooming eyes like lotus fowl. Don't go, because if you see that, your material life is finished. There's nothing left. Really, Krishna really, he's, he's the destroyer also. <laughs> But that's, that's what we want, because we can understand that material life cannot satisfy us because we're not material. Isn't that amazing? Material life can't give us happiness. Why? Because we're not material. We're spiritual. Our existence is pure spiritual being. Therefore, we can still, 
live in this world, have family, friends and occupation, but Krishna must be the center. That's why John Mastami is so important, because by honoring the Lord in this day, the Lord blesses everything in relationship to what we do. His name, his form, his qualities and pastimes, and everything that we have in our existence becomes what we say sanctified. And no longer is material. Why? Because we live simply for Krishna. That's all. Krishna Mata, Krishna Pita, Krishna Dana Pran. Everyone's looking for happiness. Everyone's looking for success. Every looking, everyone's looking for progress, knowledge. Everyone is shooting for those things that are what we say auspicious in life. You find them in Krishna. You try to find them separate from Krishna. You may get those things, but you don't get the auspiciousness that you're looking for. You get the object, but not the auspiciousness. Wealth, fame, knowledge, beauty, strength, or whatever is simply a dead body if, unless it's connected to its existence or its source, Krishna. Of course, we don't want those things anyway. We want Krishna. Because once you get attracted to Krishna, you'll think, there's nothing in this world that's useful. So that, that's, that's, the, that's the goal of Krishna consciousness. Now, I shouldn't be speaking like that. I'm supposed to tell you that you, if you worship Krishna, you'll get everything material, right? Is that what you want me to? Yeah. You'll get a good job, and your wife will like you. <laughs> And your husband will come home on time. <laughs> and everything will be nice in the family. The kids will obey most of the time. <laughs> but that's not... In other words, this world is designed in such a way as that when you bring Krishna in, everything else looks pale. <laughs> because Krishna is the source of everything. But he's not cut off from everything at the same time. So John Mastami is a very, very auspicious time. And Krishna showed his appearance, how wonderful he, when he appeared. And he, when he appeared, it wasn't so easy. I mean, Vasudeva and Devaki had to go to a prison cell and suffer under the hands of Kamsa. And Kamsa put them through so much harassment, killing their children and harassing them and putting them in chains. But Vasudeva and Devaki never lost their dedication to the Supreme Lord. They kept their faith. Krishna does that sometimes, a lot of times. He puts his devotees in difficult situations. But a devotee thinks, when it comes to Krishna, there's no difficulty. The difficulty is to forget Krishna. There's a verse in the Padma Purana, it says, what is the greatest anomaly? What is the greatest uh, misfortune? What is the greatest mistake? What is the answer to that? Who knows? To forget Krishna is the greatest anomaly, the greatest mistake. So by John Mastami is meant to help us renew our loving relationship to Krishna. Like that. Krishna appears just to enthuse us in our loving relationship. So when we hear about his pastimes, his pastimes are so sweet. You, the things in this material world, if you look for perfection, where can you find perfection in this material world? You have a beautiful wife, she's so gorgeous, she's got so many good qualities, then she gets old. <laughs> and, what, and you get old too. So where's, that's gone. <laughs> you, have a, you have wealth and somebody likes you because of your wealth. <laughs> oh, you're such a nice guy. Can I have some money? <laughs> so people, you know, whatever opulence, success, and position you have in this world, it's always fraught with inebriates. You can't find pure love, pure, what we say, success, pure wealth, is found in relationship to Krishna in the spiritual world. So therefore, this, 
that Krishna puts his devotees in these circumstances. Why? Just to, just to increase our love. That's all. He, 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 does Vasudev and Devaki, did they need to be put into difficult situations just to show their love? Their love was already perfect. But Krishna wanted to show the glories of what his devotees are like. And his devotees will do anything to sacrifice for his welfare, for his benefit. That's Krishna. <laughs> That's Krishna. And the devotee thinks, oh, if Krishna can give me some difficulty, that's nice. <laughs> Do we ever pray for difficulty? No. Does it come? Yes. Usually, it does come, right? Just living in... So, when we, when we get into difficulty, what do we think? We dial 911, right? <laughs> no. We think of Krishna. We take shelter of Krishna. We remember Krishna. We pray to Krishna. So the Krishna helps us to remember him by giving us difficulty. That's his mercy. If you, want, if you want to be free from all difficulties, there's a secret. Don't forget Krishna. <laughs> as soon as you forget Krishna, you open yourself up to difficulties. Why? Because he's a, he, then he reminds you, oh, this is what you're not looking for. <laughs> Don't forget me. So this is, this is Krishna's mercy. So he appears in this world, and he performs his activities. Kamsa was such a cruel person. He was fear personified. He was afraid of Krishna, but at the same time, he caused fear in the hearts of everyone he came in contact with. Such a cruel person. His sister, on her wedding day, and she was, you know, it says that the older brother in order to show love for the younger sister, takes charge of the younger sister on her wedding day and transports her to her, what we say, her, her husband's home. And he did that. He was thinking, I want to do some service. But when the prophecy came out of the sky, come, so you are a fool. The eighth child of your sister will be the cause of your death. All of a sudden, his so-called affection for his sister turned into hate and anger and fear. And he was ready to kill his sister. Fortunately, Vasudev was very intelligent and persuaded Kamsa. It was not easy to somehow or other accept some compromise. And what was that compromise? I'll deliver the children. And every child that was born, Kamsa killed and then when the seventh child, the seventh child came, and the seventh child was actually Sankarshan, was a manifestation of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, who was Ananta Dev himself. He appeared in the womb of Devaki. Krishna said, Oh, my plenary portion has appeared in, in the womb of, of Devaki. He said to Yogamaya, I got a service for you. In order to protect him from Kamsa, Rohini is in Vrindavan. She's also pregnant. She's another of the wife of Vasudev. Take this plenary portion, or actually Lord Balaram himself, and transform him, or transfer him, to the room of Rohini. Yoga Maya is thinking, this is impossible. The Lord has given me an impossible service to do this. But he said... You do it, and I'll empower you. So by the Lord's empowerment, she was successful. Rohini was pregnant. Devaki was present, pregnant. Rohini was pregnant for four months. She had an apparent miscarriage. Devaki at the same time. That transfer, and then of, it was, was understood that Rohini did not have a miscarriage, although everyone thought she did. He just, Yoga Maya replaced the child with Lord Valaram. And now, it was set for Krishna's appearance. Krishna was about to appear as the eighth child of Devaki in the cell, in the prison cell of Kamsa. And so, Kamsa is in anxiety. He's afraid. This person is going to kill me. The non-devotees, atheists, 
they don't like the Lord. Some of them believe in the Lord and hate the Lord. Some of them hate the Lord so much that they actually believe there's no Lord. What is an atheist anyway? An atheist is a person who had a bad experience in life and blames it on God and therefore saying that God does not exist because of this bad experience I had. That's generally what atheists are. They're usually bad experiences in life and they have this philosophy that God should be there to make everything nice for them. What doesn't happen, there's no God. Prabhupada used the example that during World War II, the Germans were fighting the British in Europe. And so the women, the mothers, the sisters, and the, uh, husband, the wives were going to the churches. They were praying, please bring my son back. Please bring my husband back. Please bring my brother back. And when that didn't happen, they gave up God. They gave up God because they thought, oh, God is my, if I pray, he should listen to my prayer. It's a decent prayer, right? And because he didn't fulfill that prayer, or apparently, from my perspective, he didn't fulfill it, therefore there's no God. Or what is the use of worshiping a God like that? <laughs> but a devotee knows that this material world is a miserable place. And therefore, taking shelter of the Lord and not praying to God for something material, but praying to him, my dear Lord, how can I serve you? How can I increase my love for you? How can I live my life in such a way that you become the center of my life? In other words, the devotees always wants Krishna more and more in their life. And they know that's the success of life. So all, even though Krishna may sometimes not appear to be there in difficult times, he's always with his devotee. So Kam, Kamsa was harassing Vasudeva and Devaki, but they never give up, gave up their allegiance to Krishna. So now Krishna was about to appear. And now Krishna arranged to appear in the mind of Vasudeva. He didn't appear like seminal injection. He appeared in a very transcendental way. He appeared first in the mind of Vasudeva. And then that mind of Vasudeva transferred into the mind of Devaki. And from Devaki's mind, Krishna went into her womb. She was effulgent. The entire jail cell was lit up simply by her presence. She looked so beautiful, carrying the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And everybody was in anxiety, especially Kamsa. <laughs> but she was so peaceful, because Krishna was with her. And now he's waiting. He's telling his guards, okay, let me know when this happens. He says, now the cause of my death has appeared. And so, Krishna was born. He was born at midnight, right on the dot. <laughs> And if you want to know the day, it was Wednesday, just in case you don't know. It says in the Gopal Champa, Krishna was born on midnight on the Wednesday, which was the first day, first minute of Wednesday. So if everything is there. Sometimes people think, yeah, these are nice stories. They're not stories. <laughs> They're factual, historical accounts of the actual activities of the Lord. So the Lord appeared, and he appeared, and he came out with dressed with a helmet and beautiful garlands, with jewelry, silken clothes, and he was carrying, he had forearms, he had conch, lotus, disc, and club. He was in his Vishnu form. Vasudev saw the Lord, and he was amazed. He started praying, offering beautiful prayers to the Lord. His heart was so happy. The Lord appeared as his own son. Can you imagine having the, 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 your son as the Lord? Your Lord? The Lord as your son? You wouldn't have to chastise him, though. It would be pretty hard to chastise God. Because, of course, if, you, if he does appear in that manifestation, he'll hide himself. But he didn't hide himself from Vasudev. Vasudev actually knew this was the Supreme Lord. 
And after offering beautiful prayers, his heart was so full of love for the Lord and feeling so fortunate, although locked up in the prison cell with this cruel king called Kamsa, his mind was completely happy. And then Devaki, she sees her son, and she's thinking, oh, my God, this is the supreme person now. She offers beautiful prayers to the Lord. And then she says, actually, you better hide yourself because Kamsa, when he finds out you take birth, he'll going to come in here and kill you. She's got this motherly affection for the Lord. She can't see the Lord as the supreme power within the universe. It's her son peered from her womb. She's seeing as, the, as her lovable son. And so she prays. And Krishna finally turns himself into a little child with two hands like that. And then, when the Lord appeared, he said, take me to Vrindavan. He wanted to, what we say, uh, what's the word? He wanted to pacify Devaki and Vasudev's anxiety because they had such fear. He said, okay, now take me out to Vrindavan. So at that point, all the guards fell asleep and all the chains were loosened. Vasudev, in the middle of the night, it was the middle of the night, Krishna had been born in midnight, took the child and it was completely dark. He couldn't see where he was going. But Ananta Shesh appeared in all his hoods with all his jewels, and his jewels lit up the way for Vasudev. At the same time, it was raining, and Ananta Shesh, you could see the picture, as a, like an umbrella over Vasudev and Krishna. Now he comes to the river Jamuna. He has to cross the river Jamuna. How to get across? The river is about up to his, almost up to his neck. He's thinking, I could wade across the river, but the river is so rough, and it's raining. I'll never make it across with Krishna. All of a sudden, he, he understands within his heart. Anantashe speaks to him, no fear. And then the, the river parted, and there was a pathway right through the river. Vasudev is now happy. He goes, he's walking through the river. There's big waves on each side, but he's walking down the middle. All of a sudden, something happens. The water recedes and starts coming down and starts splashing on him. And Krishna gets hit with the water, and all of a sudden, he lost Krishna. His Krishna is it's, it's like floating in the water. He can't find Krishna. He's like besides himself with anxieties. He's always oh, he's, he's just mortified. Oh, he's praying, what happened, what happened? And then all of a sudden, Jamuna, she said, here's your son. She said, I'm sorry, she apologized, <laughs> but I wanted to get to play with him for a little while. <laughs> so the Dwiver Jamuna took the opportunity to play with Krishna for a little while. So you matter, Vasudev's going through this, you know, he has to go through all this. But he doesn't care because this is, this is his service. This is the point you have to remember. Never become discouraged because your, your service is difficult or it's made, it seems impossible. Because these things bring us closer to Krishna. So now finally he goes, he rides at Braj and it's quiet, the village is quiet. Mother Yasoda has just had a child, and she's asleep. All the cowherd men are asleep. Anantashesh makes everything nice for Vasudev to come. He sees a little girl laying next to Mother Yasoda. He takes baby Krishna, puts him there, takes the girl and leaves and returns to the prison cell of Kamsa. Mother Yasoda didn't know. She was overwhelmed with childbirth. And then she didn't know whether she had a boy or a girl. But at that time, something very mystical happened. She had twins. She had a boy and a girl. But no one could see the boy. And when Vasudev put Krishna down, Vaikuntha Krishna, who was born in the jail cell, 
Vrindavan Krishna, who was also born to Mother Yasoda, and Vaikuntha Krishna became one. And when she woke up, there was a boy there. So Krishna was actually born in Vrindavan. And he was also born in Mathura at the same time. So actually, sometimes we say, well, Krishna was born in Mathura. He was born in Vrindavan. Mother Yasoda had twins, a boy and a girl. And that boy became unmanifest until Vasudeva actually delivered Krishna. And now he's taking the girl back, and then he gives it to Devaki. The jail cells close up. The guards awake. They alert Kamsa. Kamsa comes. Now he's anxiety. He runs. He takes his sword. He's ready to destroy this little baby. And Devaki says, actually, Kamsa, it's a girl. You have no fear of a girl. Please let me have this child. You've already killed six of my children. He has no compassion. No compassion. He grabs the child from her forcibly. He holds her up in the air, ready to dash her on a rock. And as soon as he does that, she flies out of his hand and appears in eight-armed form. She's Durga Devi. <laughs> she said, Kamsa, you fool, you rascal. You can't kill me. And the person that's going to kill you is somewhere else. She's already born. <laughs> So stop being so cruel. <laughs> Kamsa has a change of heart. Sometimes demons do something nice once in a while. And his heart changed. And when his heart changed, he actually felt a little repentant. He was humbled. And then, of course, Durga Devi disappeared. And then Kamsa apologized to Vasudeva and Devaki, started to preach philosophy, that it's not my fault, I was under the influence of the material energy, don't blame me. <laughs> He's like asking for forgiveness. But he was so sincere, and he was speaking philosophy at the same time. A Vaishnava is always compassionate, or what we say forgiving. This is a very important part. Forgiveness is one of the highest qualities of a devotee. If you want to be happy in life, practice forgiveness. People do things that you don't like. They say things you don't like. They cause you difficulty. It's just the way the world is. As long as there's other people or events around, there's always going to be something we don't like. Somebody's going to disturb us. Sometimes somebody even causes us difficulties in life. But a Vaishnava, those who practice service to the Supreme Lord, always are forgiving. Why? Because they know that if I'm not forgiving, then when I do something wrong, I want to be forgiven also. Right? So those who forgive are also forgiven. Like that. That's true. But that, that is a selfish reason. That is a selfish reason. The real reason is that when you learn to forgive, you can actually become humble, actually become tolerant, actually become happy. Those who hold grudges towards others are never happy. Never happy. I was giving a lecture in London a few years ago on Bhaktivedanta Manor, and this large group of people came, and there was one lady she, I asked for questions at the end of the lecture. The lecture was about Vaishnava relationships. What are the nature of Vaishnava relationships? So she held her question after the class. She came up to me. She said, Maharaj, I got to speak to you. I said, what is it? She said, well, I have this problem. I, uh, this one person, she did something really bad to me. And I can't forgive her. So my first question was, how long ago did that happen? She said, 25 years ago. I said, you're still holding it? She says, I don't know what to do. I said, you better let it go. Because <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know what else to say, because it's really killing you. The person who holds the negativity towards others is the person who suffers less than the person who committed it, although they also suffer. 
So forgiveness. Vasudev and Devaki could have said, you Kamsa, now you're in a, a difficult situation. You want forgiveness. Pooh, we're not going to forgive you. But they didn't. Because their, their hearts are pure, and they always think of the welfare of others, they forgave Kamsa, who was sin personified. This is the quality of the Vaishnavas. And now Krishna took his birth. And then, of course, we know all the pastimes of Krishna in Vrindavan, how Kamsa was sending demon after demon. And the residents of Vrindavan were living with Krishna, and they had to go through all that. Every time a demon would come, he would, just like the bull demon Arista, when he came, he was galloping into the area of Vraj, and it said that all the women had miscarriages just by his galloping, because it was shaking the earth. So Krishna put his, puts his devotees into difficult situations. Why? Why does he do that? He, he's vengeful. He likes to see his devotees suffer. No. He wants to glorify his devotees because he knows their devotion is not, doesn't waver in the face of difficulties. And at the same time, if there's a little material attachment left, these difficulties bring them closer to Krishna. So he's fulfilling, he's destroying our material attachment at the same time, he's glorifying his devotees. Krishna likes to glorify his devotees. Krishna does everything, but he gives his credit to the devotees. Krishna wants his temple repaired. He appears in the dream of the pujari or the temple present, says, fix my temple, do something. That person does it and he gets the credit. Krishna doesn't ask for any credit. He empowers his devotees to do things on his own will and the devotees get the credit and he glorifies the devotees. So we glorify Vasudeva and Devaki, how much they had to undergo, how much suffering they had to go but they never considered it suffering. For us, it looks like suffering. But because we don't know their hearts, which are pure and full of devotion, the difficulties they encounter, and Bhaktivinoda Thakur says this. Not only does he say it, he says it emphatically. He says, my dear Lord, what is my happiness? What makes me happy? And then, after conjecturing in so many ways, he ends by saying, my happiness is the difficulties I encounter in your service. Wow. So don't look for difficulties. <laughs> That's not the idea. But they'll come. They'll come. And therefore, we take shelter of Krishna. But we don't have to worry about taking shelter of Krishna when difficulty comes because just living in this world is difficult. There's birth, there's disease, there's old age, there's new age. This is <laughs> so, many, so many miseries. And then, of course, death. <laughs> so, you know, there's so many difficulties in this material world. We don't have to look for them. They come one after another. So, but a devotee says, thank you, Krishna. <laughs> now I have a chance to, to feeling. Queen Kunti, we're reading from the prayers of Queen Kunti. She is in a good material position. She has everything. But she says, my dear Lord, give me some suffering. Give me some calamities. Why? Because I'm so comfortable that I forget you. And therefore, if you give me some calamities, then I won't rem they'll be able to remember you always. And remembering you means no more birth and death in this world. She's praying like that. Of course, that might be difficult for us to pray like that, but we should understand that this is the quality of a devotee. Always wants to remember Krishna in all circumstances. So his divine grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Srila Prabhupada, has made remembrance of Krishna very easy. He composed the Srimad Bhagavatam. 
And before he composed the Srimad Bhagavatam, he, in 1970, was thinking, I am an old man. I could leave at any moment. I want to give the, Lord, the devotees of this movement an opportunity to hear and read about Krishna in his pastimes in Vrindavan. So Prabhupada did something. He spoke the entire Srimad Bhagavatam summation, and he put it into one book called Krishna. The Supreme Personality of God. The entire pastimes of the Lord as he appears in this world all the way up to the time he, that he disappears, 90 chapters of Srimad Bhagavatam, which is like very voluminous, is condensed in this one book called Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And Srila Prabhupada would read his own books and this was one of his favorite books to read. He would sit in a garden and he would have his devotees read the stories of Krishna and he would laugh and make comments. Now who, what author writes a book and then reads his own book? Everybody else reads it, right? You maybe read it once for editing. But Prabhupada, Prabhupada would say, I'm not writing. Krishna's speaking, the words, these are Krishna's words. I'm writing them down, that's all. These are Krishna's words. They're not my words. So this, this book, The Supreme Personality of Godhead, Krishna, is very, very concise nectar. And if you take advantage on this John Mastami day to get a copy of this book, then the mercy of the Lord will be even greater because today is Krishna's appearance day. So I'll end my lecture with a little sales pitch. <laughs> Please take a copy of this home. It's only ten dollars. That's nothing. Ten dollars. You can't do much with ten dollars these days, right? <clears throat> so we have at least ten copies here, and of course there's more copies. So make your John Mastami complete. Take Krishna home in the form of transcendental literature. And the first three chapters are describing Krishna's appearance in this world. Thank you very much. Sri Krishna Chaitanya Mahaprabhu ki. Sri Krishna Janmashtami ki. Gaur Premanandi Hari Hari Bo. And if you want a copy, let's see, where's my, uh, okay, there's Shiv. So give him your $10 and he'll turn it in, he's honest and take a copy of Krishna book, The Supreme Personality of Godhead, and put it on your shelf, read it, and live, relive John Mastami every day. <laughs> Thank you very much.